Welcome to the Delaware CTR Excel Innovative Discovery Series. For the good stuff, there's some housekeeping. Online participants, please keep your microphones muted unless you're asking a question. And you can use the chat feature in blue jeans if you have technical questions. Previous presentations are available on the website. You must sign in to receive CME credit. And you can use the blue jeans chat feature contact Sarah Fay to receive credit for viewing online. Some upcoming talks are on inverse probability rating and bootstrapping on May 15th. And on May 29th, it's essential surgery and safe anesthesia services. When I came to the Value Institute, I found out that analysis of randomized clinical trials is a lot easier than observational studies. There are many complexities in observational studies. One of the methods of dealing with it is propensity scores, and that's the topic of today's talk. The speaker, Dr. Zhu Lei Zhang, is a senior biostatistician here at the Value Institute at Christiana, and a research assistant professor at Thomas Jefferson University. He has a broad background in health outcomes research, public health, epidemiology, and biostatistics. He was the first author on the lead public publication on cost-effectiveness revascularization strategies in the January issue of the Journal of American College of Cardiology. The title of today's talk is Propensity Score Matching for Estimating Treatment Effects. Dr. Zang. Good afternoon. Thank you for your introduction, Rick. In today's talk, I'm going to talk about um, the clinical trials and the observational studies in terms of uh, the treatment effects in order to address the bias in observational studies. In today's talk, I'm going to focus on how can we use the propensity score to address and reduce the bias. In today's talk, I'm going to focus on propensity score matching so that we can reduce the bias for observational studies. In the last, I'm going to give you an example um, to show how can we use uh, propensity score to address the bias in large observational studies. In the medical studies, if we would like to address the um, impact of treatment, we have some basic notations, like we have a variable to indicate treatment. And here, we use T equals 1, indicate um, subjects or patients in the treatment group. T equals 0, indicate in control or non-exposed or non-interventional group. After we have a treatment variable, one of the important things of our study is to have outcomes. We usually use Y to indicate outcome, and we use one, Y1I to indicate the outcomes in the treatment group, Y0I indicated the outcomes in the control group. In addition to treatment and outcomes, another part of the important thing in the study is this. You look at the covariance. Here we will focus on the baseline covariance. So we have these basic notations. When we look at the effect of treatment on outcomes, actually we have, as we just pointed out, we have outcomes, we have the treatment, and we have the covariance. So the estimated the effect of treatment on outcome conditional on and based on covariance. So this is the our um, whole process for the uh, effect of treatment on outcomes. Suppose we can observe the outcomes in treatment and uh, control groups. We can get the individual treatment effect, which is just the difference between the outcomes in treatment group and uh, control group. If we take the expectation, we will get the average treatment effect. If we look further, 
based upon some subgroup or some baseline occurrence, we can get the exacerbation of the difference between treatment and the control group. But in practice, it's not easy for us to observe the whole effect for treatment and the control group. So usually we need to find a estimation for the potential outcomes. So this is the reason why we just have the observed outcomes. Because for the true outcomes, this is uh, uh, the thing we need to estimate or examine. The best way for us to look at the effect of treatment is randomized clinical trials. Because for the randomized clinical trials, we do not have a, a confounding effect so that we can get the average effect of treatment and control is just to look at the effect in treatment group and the control group, which means Randomized clinical trials can guarantee that, on average, we can see no systematic differences in observed and unobserved covariance. So this is a big assumption, and this is the reason why randomized clinical trials are called golden standard study design. But in observational studies, there are often systematic differences in the distribution of baseline characteristics between treatment and the control group, between exposure and non-exposure, or interventional and non-interventional groups. And um, or sometimes the treatment group and the control group, or interventional or non-interventional groups, includes no non-overlapping set of values, which means the distributions for some covariance may be very different in two groups, which means in some current values could exist in one group, but maybe no other information in another group. So um, in order to address this uh, uh, issues, traditional um, method for controlling for confounding may be not appropriate. Because of the, the, this sort of um, bias, so when we try to compare outcomes, basically it is impossible to directly compare the outcomes between the two groups as we just showed before, which means we cannot directly compare the outcomes for uh, treatment group and the control groups, which means we have to develop some new statistical method to minimize the effects of confounding. And then we can possibly get an unbiased estimate of treatment effects. So this is, the, this is one of the big differences between observational studies and clinical trials. What is the solution? In recent decades, mathematicians and statisticians have figured out a very good way which is uh, to use the propensity score to address the challenges I just mentioned. This propensity score can be uh, tracked back to 1983. Uh, this um, propensity score first uh, um, mentioned in a seminar. And uh, the, the basic idea for propensity score is to look at the likelihood that the patient that receive treatment even based on characteristics and the other risk factors. And then we would like to see what kind of covariance are potential confounders. So covariance can be like a confounder only if its distribution in treatment and the control different. So this is the reason why we just mentioned that for the randomized clinical trials, we do not need to worry about confounders because in the randomized clinical trials, the covariance are the same, the distribution and the values statistically are the very similar for the two groups. And uh, 
the advantage, one of the advantages for um, the propensity scores are so popular in recent years is that propensity score can provide a summary measure to control for multiple confounders simultaneously. We will see how can we develop a single value which is called a propensity score and then can um, let us to address the selection bias and the challenges we just uh, uh, mentioned. Statistically, the concept of a propensity score is uh, pretty simple, and uh, it's not new for us. Propensity score can be defined as a conditional probability that a subject receives the treatment or exposure or uh, interventional, given a set of the subjects that observe the covariance uh, matrix. So propensity score is just a conditional probability. And it can be uh, figured out by just uh, using logistic regression. And uh, then here we have a two things. One, we have a treatment or exposure or intervention. Another is covariance. For the propensity score itself, has nothing to do with outcomes. So when we try to figure out or calculate a propensity score do not mess with outcomes. So, and the important thing is that we have a treatment. We have a clearly defined treatment or exposure or intervention. So, no clear defined treatment, no clear defined exposure or intervention, no propensity score. So, if we would like to use the propensity scores to address some um, studies in observational studies, we have to first keep in mind that we have to define the clearly about uh, treatment, exposure, or intervention. If we cannot uh, um, determine what kind of exposure or intervention in our observational studies, I would like to say the propensity scores are not an appropriate way for us to consider. Question. We just mentioned that the propensity score is the conditional probability for patients to get treatment or exposure or um, uh, intervention. But in our observational studies, we already know which patients already have exposure or condition? Which patients uh, didn't have exposure or um, uh, intervention? Why we bother to estimate the probability a patient receives treatment? For example, if we have a observational study like uh, I was mentioned uh, later, we have patients uh, among cabbage and um, PCI. We already know some patients get a cabbage, some patients get a PCI. Why do we still need to estimate the probability that a patient get a um, cabbage? The answer is that because for the patients who already get like uh, exposure or intervention or some procedures, they have to follow some procedures or guidelines. But some guidelines are not so are not so clear. I sh I would like to say are not so oh, oh, be determined. So that some 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 doctors for the same patient, some doctors maybe choose cabbage. Some doctor maybe choose PCI. So this is the reason why we need to figure out the probability for patient who get exposure or intervention. Most importantly. We can adjust the observed treatment with the probability of treatment with a quasi-randomized study. So the fundamental goal of propensity score is to create a study. That study will very similar to like clinical trials. So this is called the quasi-randomized study. So that after we Get um, this propensity scores for treatments or control patients with the same or similar propensity score 
we can imagine they were randomly assigned to each other. We will see how this would happen in our next um, slides. And then, so, so that after we get a propensity score, we can get a quasi-randomized study. And then we can randomly assign the patients to each group so that the subject is in treatment or control groups with equal propensity score could have the similar distribution in covariance, which means after we get a propensity score and by doing some statistical um, uh, handling, we can get uh, the two group of patients who will have the similar propensity score so that we can handle the effect of treatment just as we did for randomized clinical trial. So this is the reason why we need to create a propensity score for patients who already have like a exposure or intervention. So here, after we uh, suppose we have a propensity score now, the effect of treatment on outcomes will be like this. We have a treatment, we have covariance, and then we have uh, outcomes. So by using propensity score, we artificially or synthetically balance the, the covariance for the two treatment groups. So this is the basic idea. <coughs> Any questions? OK. Let's look at uh, the um, um, propensity score. As um, I just mentioned, uh, propensity score is a conditional probability. Probability means the values of a prob for propensity score always between 0 and 1. And then, suppose we have a clinical trials the data set. Can we calculate a propensity score for clinical trials data? Yes, we can. What's the a propensity score? The propensity score should be pretty simple, just 0.5. So for the randomized um, uh, clinical trials, for each patient, the propensity score will be just 0.5, which means which is independent of patient characteristics, and the distribution is the same across the treatment groups. What does it mean? Propensity score 0.5, what, what does it mean? That's the equal chance. Yeah, that's the equal chance. The patient, the, each patient have equal chance either in treatment group or control group. So, for the, so this is the um, basic result for clinical trials. And then, for observational studies, the probability of a patient who will be in the treatment group or exposure or intervention depends upon the patient characteristics and the code difference between the um, treatment groups because the treatment sometimes somehow related to covariance. So generally speaking, when we look at um, uh, this propensity score for observational studies, we can predict that the propensity score for treatment or for exposure for the intervention of the propensity score should be higher than the propensity score for patients who had uh, like a control group or exposure or uh, intervention. Of course, that depends upon your definition. You can, uh, you can define uh, the treatment um, uh, by different ways. So when we do the propensity score, Propensity score has become very popular in statistics and our medical studies. Just one of the most important reasons is that propensity score's method has been based upon very strong theoretical background. So this is, propensity score has a, some assumptions. The first assumption is Stable unit treatment value assumption, which means one subject responds to treatment has nothing to do with another subject responds to the treatment. So this is the first assumption. And this is a, this assumption I should say is reasonable. The second um, assumption is that 
The outcomes is conditional independent of treatment assignment given observed covariance. If it's not, what would happen? Which means in that study, we only have one choice. For example, for the children to get like um, some um, flu shot. So maybe in, in some literature, we do, we do not need to redo analysis. Like uh, also like for the relationship between smoking and non-cancer. Maybe in current days, we do not need to do um, another observational study, which means the outcome, the relationship between outcome and the treat and the exposure are quite clear. Okay, this means when you assign when one patient that you treatment a lot, you don't know the, you don't you don't you don't have very clear ideas about the outcomes. Yeah, like uh, the relationship between non-cancer and the smoking, we have very clear uh, um, ideas about the relationship between non-cancer and the smoking. So, so it's um, not necessary for us to sign or to look at this kind of things. So the, this is the strongly ignorable or treatment assignment assumption, which means sign which exposure or non-exposure in the example of smoking and non-cancer, this treatment assignment cannot be ignored. The third one we just mentioned, because as a probability, the value always between zero and one. The last one is a big challenge for observational studies. When we calculate the propensity group, we always assumed that we have all the covariance in this study, which means if unmeasured confounders exist, cannot provide any information for propensity score. In other words, the propensity score cannot address unmeasured confounders. So uh, this is the four assumptions for uh, propensity score. Propensity score uh, has have very uh, desirable properties. First, the propensity score is a balanced score because the one of the important purpose for us to use um, propensity scores is to balance the control and the uh, um, treatment group. The second one, after we get uh, the propensity score, we can um, get uh, the average treatment effect, which means we can look at the effect of treatment based upon the propensity, propensity score, which means after we use the propensity score, we can expect the impact for the different um, treatment group, just the difference between treatment group and uh, control group. This is based upon propensity score, and this is the fundamental goal for uh, propensity score. And that, and then we can get the overall average treatment effect, which is the individual treatment effect average over the distribution of, of covariance, which means after we get the propensity score, we use the propensity score to get the approximately true effect of treatment. So, so this is the purpose of using propensity score. Okay, <clears throat> how can we get the propensity score? Usually, in observational studies, we cannot uh, have the propensity score in the data set. So, propensity score usually should be to be estimated. As I just mentioned, propensity score estimated by logistic regression given the, the covariance uh, data set. And here, we can define as our notation set. T equals one is the event for the patient in the treatment group. And uh, uh, the independent variables are just the observed covariance. Once, um, once more, outcomes cannot be participated in the propensity score. Okay.
Sometimes maybe we would like to compare three or four procedures. In this kind of situation, we still can use propensity score. Propensity score for each experiment can be estimated by fitting multi-normal logistic regression. And then we can just set up one treatment as a reference category. Okay. How can we, because of the uh, few uh, estimated the propensity score, we have to use logistic regression, and uh, then we have to use the covariance matrix. How can we identify potential confounders? Because in, uh, in the observational studies, maybe our variables or covariance, like um, 100 or even 1,000. So how can we identify potential confounders? As uh, we just mentioned that, we can see a, a covariant, um, a covariant um, become a becomes a confounder only if its attribution is significantly different in treatment and the control group. So the, maybe the first step is that we have a treatment, we have a control, and then we do a um, univariate analysis and look at uh, uh, the coherence one by one and see a, we will see which coherence uh, are um, significantly different between two groups. But I thought we want, in any case, we wanted to include as many uh, covariates as possible and have a huge, huge logistic regression. Yeah. Um, you can do like this, because um, this is the second. If we're uncertain where the covariance is confounded, just put it into model. So in, in this way, um, because maybe sometimes you, you don't want to do universal analysis one by one, you can just put all of it into it. But uh, in in terms of uh, model uh, modeling, so after the, after reach, reaching some number of currents, the results will not be changed to much, as you just mentioned. Include all potential confounders, and then include as many observed observed the three treatment variables as possible. And here. <coughs> Statistical significance of individual determinants are not as important. So, which means you, it's not necessary for you to do like a univariate or t test to compare the significant difference between two groups. For example, the 1983 people I just mentioned they include like 74 covariance in the logistic propensity model. But and as I mentioned many times, you can include all potential confounders, but no outcomes. So, when we try to generate a propensity score, we consider only a, the currents measured pre treatment. And the, the, those treatments should not change over time, which means if we have some time variant. Coherence that will need another special method to handle. Here we only handle the coherence pre-treatment. And um, um, also, oh, sometimes even so we can include all, but if like a uh, hundred, thousand, mm -hmm. so we can base it upon like a clinical or other theoretical method to made some um, selection, but additional model variable selection, like a stepwise selection, is not a good way for us to choose the variable. So experience or other findings um, should be um, much uh, more useful to select the variable. Okay, after we put uh, those variables, the coherence into the model, but sometimes we cannot get the balanced uh, results. So in that case, we can consider like a higher order polynomial uh, situations. So for example, if like a BMI, maybe we can put like a BMI square. And sometimes we can put like interactions, like a, um, uh, uh, age, the interaction of age and the BMI or something like that. Okay. After we get uh, them the uh, logistic regression, we can we can we can use the logistic regression technique to look at uh, 
the model to fit like we can use ROC or C index to look at uh, uh, how well the logistic regression has been used to estimate uh, preferences score. But um, sometimes, even though your C index is uh, too low or, or too high, uh, you should not play so much in important uh, roles to decide your logistic regression model. So how do you decide to include a higher order like polynomials or interaction? I mean, what, why would you do that? Is it, is it, do you have first to look at your model and see whether it's not well balanced? And then you, you go back to your propensity score if it's not well balanced? Uh, this, I think uh, uh, sh we should base it upon like uh, other funding. Uh, even you just mentioned that if we need to look at the balance between the two groups and then to add it, this is another way. Okay, after we get the preferences to go, we have to look at, uh, we have to assess the balance produced by preferences to go. So um, there are four different ways. First, we look at the standardized difference of each covariance between two groups. And then uh, we look at the propensity score distribution. This is the very common way. And uh, compare distribution of covariance between treatment and uh, control groups. This is uh, required for observational study um, and uh, for the, the model phase. So number two and number three basically are required for the observational studies. When we look at the distribution of propensity score for the two groups, what are we going to look at? We look at the overlap for the propensity score for two groups. And then, if not enough overlap, if completely disjoint, what does it mean? Well, which means no need to do this study. Because it's very clear. <laughs> so, you, if we completely disjoint, which means stop. <laughs> you, and you can try to add some interaction terms, and, uh, polynomial, and all kinds of things. I don't think you put a higher order polynomial or interaction can change it too much. Okay. This is the based upon my experience. Okay. And uh, oh, because why? If completely disjoint um, distribution, we should stop. Because observations with no overlap cannot be used in like a matched analysis. So no no ground for us to continue. Okay, see here. Suppose we have uh, uh, this distribution and then and then here we should say we have um, exposure and no not uh, and non exposure. Suppose the distribution like this. And for this area, no exposed. And for this area, this is just the exposed. So for patients with um, propensity score in this way, we cannot find the matched uh, uh, patients. Same, similarly for this area. So when we try to Get a balance for the two groups, we only can look at the patients between this common area, common support area. So this is the reason why we need to look at the distribution of propensity score. So that we can get some general ideas about how many patients we can include in this study. As I just mentioned, if we completely disjointed, no patients will be included in the studies. And here, this is like um, generated from, um, from CSN, and then this is the estimated probability. Estimated probability means the propensity score, and C making this is some corresponding um, propensity score. Very good. Uh, okay, sometimes uh, if it's too good, which means almost like a clinical trial. Okay, so when we do this um, propensity score adjustment, we would uh, basically we have three steps. First, 
we estimate a propensity score. And then we evaluate covariance balance given propensity scores. After that, we will need to use some strategies to do and then to do further analysis. Those strategies include like regression, stratification, matching, and weighting. So we will see like uh, say this is for stratification, which means the data, the propensity score for the two two groups can divide into several strata, and then uh, uh, we can do regular analysis within each strata. Um, in the original paper, they showed that perfect stratification based upon propensity score can produce strata where our average treatment effect within strata is unbiased estimate of true treatment effect. How, mar how large is this stratification? Um, the basic experience is five. Next time I will say if we choose five strata and how, um, what percentage of bias can be reduced. Stratification on propensity to go along can balance distribution of coherence without increase the number of strata. So this is about a strata. And then to, um, our focus is on the matching. So, so this is for this uh, um, distribution of um, propensity score. And then for the, for the common area, we can do the matching analysis. So substances consider both treatment and the control group with the same propensity. After we do matching, we can balance the coherence distribution to make a treatment and a control subject very similar and to produce a study with a minimized coherence bias. So after uh, we get them, so the basic procedures for propensity to match is like a follow these steps. First, Identify propensity score model, which means which variables are included in the logistic regression. And then estimate uh, propensity score with all data. Here, we should be very careful. Should be handled missing data first. If, if uh, at least like uh, in first procedure, if there are some variable with, uh, patient variable with missing, they will not generate a propensity score. And then, Compute the distance between any two subjects. The first step is very tough. Create a matched pair with a specific matching algorithm. I will talk about it later. And then, after we have matched the data sets for two groups, we check coherent balance. And then, we will do some analysis. And then, finally, we get the average treatment effect by using specific uh, method. If uh, like a hazard ratio, like a survival rate, and like a cost effectiveness. So what kind of algorithm can we, um, for us to get the matching? The basic idea is that for the two groups, the propensity score, if close enough, which means it can match. So we use the nearest available matching on estimated propensity score. So we use the nearest uh, neighbor arg algorithm. So we can set up like uh, either um, three standard deviation or some like uh, three decimal. And then we can use the optimum, optimal algorithm to minimize the total difference for the overall population offers the best matching result. Uh, there are some um, statistical software, like uh, in this data, we can use the uh, uh, propensity score match two to get uh, the match the score. And uh, for the set, there is a greedy uh, macro to get uh, like uh, um, match propensity score within like uh, uh, five to five decimals, three decimals until one or one decimal. So we can use this uh, those procedures to get uh, the match the data set. After the data set, we need to check the balance in the coherence between the exposed and the unexposed groups. If not balanced, balanced means 
for each occurrence, there are uh, uh, no significant difference. Not a balance that means after we do some um, um, preferential score, and then we look at, uh, we check at the co covariance. We still find they have a significant difference. What should we do? Come back. <laughs> As Kadali <laughs> mentioned, we may, we may put more variables, we may put a higher order polynomials, we may put a, a interaction, which means we can modify the model. And then um, to uh, check again, if balanced, which means or most, or most important occurrence are balanced. And then we can do our research, and like we can get like an odds ratio, hazard ratio, uh, and so on. So, so basically, based on my experience, we may need to uh, do at least the um, two or three rounds. Okay. Matching. Professor did um, score matching compared to our um, ordinary adjusted by covariance because the professor is score was based upon the covariance. And uh, when we do like uh, multivariate analysis, we can adjust it by or another variables. What's the difference? Different is that measure can always reduce the bias. We do not need to worry about the true regression equation. This is very important because when we use like a multivariate analysis, we put a, like a adjusted for by age, gender. Maybe the format is not correct, which means like the results and the dependent variable outcome and the coherence not linear or the relationship is wrong. But for the matching, we do not need to worry about the true regression. And, um, after we matching, we can do some post matching analysis because our uh, matching just uh, f focus on the common ground uh, propensity score. So, the, so these are the big differences between propensity score matching adjusted uh, and uh, regression adjusted for another for other variables. So uh, let's uh, see, for the matched propensity score, we first get the propensity score and then identify matched pairs. After that, we assess the um, quantity of balanced match and then we can do analysis. So uh, now let's move on um, to look at the application. Before I um, talk about this application, any questions so far? Yeah, I'm still uh, intrigued by the, the notion of uh, putting interaction and, and, and uh, high order, but we, we can talk about this. Okay, sure, okay. Uh, yeah, the, this is a project that um, <laughs> we have been conducted in recent years. This is, is a large uh, PCI register and a large cabbage register data set. Uh, the, in this data set, we use the propensity score to compare clinical outcomes. So patient selected for cabbage had a long-term survival advantage over those selected for PCI. This is our results. And then uh, in this study, we chose from about 2 million patients nationwide. And finally, follow some procedures. We get um, PCI group patients about 100,000 100, and cabbage patients with 86,000. Um, First. This is uh, the observational study. So we can see that if we look at uh, the baseline characteristics of all patients, we can see that the two group patients, cabbage and the PCI, are significantly different in almost uh, all the uh, covariance, except for um, this one, yeah, BMI. So if we just uh, compare or those two two group patients, the results will be misleading. So this is the um, basic um, situation. And then we try to develop a propensity score for cabbage in patients undergoing isolated cabbage or PCI for chronic uh, stable disease. Okay, the per the probability is what 
what is the probability? The probability of a patient who received cabbage. What does it mean? Which means it is possible for patients who receive the PCI had some chance to get cabbage. So in our analysis, we will treat for the treatment that will be T equals one if patient in cabbage group, T equals zero if patient if patients in GCI group. So this is the treatment. And then the variables included in the professor school model consists of four types of variables, like demographic variables, clinical variables, hospital variables, and coronary disease variable. So we have like a dem demographic a hospital and um, uh, coronary disease patients, uh, the situation variables. As um, uh, Claudine mentioned uh, that we use the GFR as a linear, as linear and, uh, and then we based upon other findings. We use them like for the, for the, uh, the BMI, we use the like um, squared. So all other continuous variables were modeled as a flexible polynomial with linear or quadratic components. Um, based on experience, it is not necessary to, in, to include the um, variables higher than two, which means a quadratic uh, should be enough. We do not need to include it like a cubic. Okay, after we get the propensity score, this is the distribution of propensity score for cabbage in the PCI and the cabbage population. Yeah, Dr. Wintrouble once said that. He prefer for the distribution of percentage go together instead of the picture I showed before generated by Seth. So because if we put like a, a to, together, we, we will say that this uh, the probability is for patients who get a cabbage. So for patients who get a cabbage, they have higher probability. This makes sense. Otherwise. Otherwise, what the doctors uh, who treat uh, uh, who treated these patients uh, uh, sort of like uh, what is the best that I can see that they didn't follow the procedures. And also, we can see the patient who get a PCI had a much lower probability to receive what to receive cabbage. So this is the reason why for the. Um, a PCI patient, his propensity to go are much lower. And this is the reason why for the cabbage patient, the probability of getting a patient much higher. And then our interest is on what? It's on the common area. So, for example, for patients who had like uh, the probability of getting for the PCI, like with the probability at 0.04, we can just find a very few patients in cabbage to match, which means a lot. Which means a lot of patients, a lot of PCI patients with propensity 0.04 cannot be included in the analysis. Same as here, the patients who will be who were included in the study just the in the arm support area. So uh, one day Dr. Wintrouble suggested that for any observational studies using propensity score, we should require to generate a distribution picture like this. After we match, uh, after we, have, we, we get the propensity score, we um, Try to find the matching data set to ensure transparency and the comparability of cabbage and the PCI population. We use one to one matching without replacement. And then we restrict it into the cabbage and the PCI patients matching in three or more decimal propensities. And the, after we match, we will get the baseline characteristics assessment. So 
this is our result. First, we would like to say we have like um, more than 100,000 patients in PCI. We have more than 86,000 patients in cabbage. After match in terms of propensity score, we because we do one by one match, so we have uh, 43,084 uh, patients in each group. On the one hand, the number of patients per match is still pretty large compared to other studies. So this is one of the reasons for the large number of um, uh, um, patients. So we can use a propensity score. And then half the match. But on the other hand, how many patients we lost? So we can see here, see here, I think I would like to see about 60% uh, of patients were not included in the study. But uh, even though we still have not enough patients to do analysis, so this is one of the advantages for large, for big data in observational studies. Otherwise, uh, next time I will show in some studies, so maybe half the match, the sample size will drop so significantly lower to that the number of patients included in the studies uh, are not so meaningful. But in our, in our study, we still have enough patients. So this is just your analytic group. Yeah. But in this, this table, everything is still very different between the two. Everything is statistically different between the two groups. They're still, it's like they're not matched very well. Yeah, they are. I mean, they are, they are okay. Okay, here, here is the unadjusted. So I okay. adjusted it before the propensity. Right. Yeah, oh. this is adjusted. This is a match. Okay. Yeah. Right. So we can see that after the match, we can see almost the all um, all of the important uh, coherence become balanced, which means if we look at it here, the result of the match the data set, they will pretty look like a clinical trial, which means no significant difference between the two groups for baseline characteristics. Okay, after we did that, we have this um, uh, mortality for 30 day, one year, two years, three year, and four year results. So we can see the unadjusted and the matched um, data set. We can see the the results are pretty close in the similar direction. The reason can be explained is that with the sample size becoming very large, the results are pretty stable. Any questions? Okay, um, I talked about how can we use the propensity score matching. So. When we use the propensity school method, we can do something in the observation that is more completed and efficiently address the observed confounding or exposure outcome relationship. If we look at it like in terms of statistics, this propensity score can address like a selection bias. If like Claudio interested in like epidemiology, this propensity score can uh, can efficiently address the non-randomized of the exposure. So the, the, the reason is that we change by using propensity score observational studies to like a quasi-randomized a clinical trials so that we can mimic a randomization and then simultaneously match people on the baseline correct risk peaks so that we can ask like researchers to design a study so that we can balance uh, um, observational studies. So this is the way why, this is the reason why uh, propensity score become very popular in recent uh, days. Okay, propensity score method has some limitations. First, propensity score works pretty well in very large observational studies. If the sample size is not in, not enough, so as we just mentioned, maybe the matched area will be quite small, so uh, we cannot uh, um, do some very meaningful studies. 
And uh, in, uh, if the sample size is um, uh, small, maybe the imbalance will happen. And uh, one, one of the important things I just mentioned that the other um, propensity score cannot address the effect of unmeasured confounding. For this issue, this cannot be solved in terms of propensity score. We have to do sensitivity analysis. And uh, also, if our sample size is large enough, and then we would like to do some propensity score. If we try to match, we will know a lot of patients. What should we do to improve this method? I will address our new method next Friday. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What would the uh, the propensity distribution graph? What would that look like for a randomized control trial? For well, randomized control trial, will be like because the the probability will point five, just like in the middle. Yeah. So it would be like a normal curve around. Not a normal. No. Just a, just just if just a very concentrating on the middle point of point five. So, so last time we talked about uh, instrumental variable. Mm -hmm. and now we are talking about propensity score. So when what when do you choose what? When do okay. What what's uh, what's the advantage in the <coughs> instrumental variable versus uh, versus a propensity score? Or when when would you choose propensity score versus? A I should I would like to say that uh, propensity score is uh, much easier to implement. And uh, the, to my knowledge, it's not easy for researchers to choose a appropriate instrument, variable instrument. Yeah. So, like uh, some in recent years, some people like uh, use zip code, use like uh, uh, distance between central hospital and um, patients. Yeah. But uh, it's not easy. Yeah, the, 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 the best uh, variable instrument is uh, RCT. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.